Love and empathy have been declining at alarming rates. A study published in the Social, Psychological, and Personality Science Journal in 2019 analyzed data from over 70 studies involving over 1,400 participants across 36 countries and found empathy levels have been declining globally since the 1970s. Save the Children organization discovered levels of empathy among young people in the UK have declined by almost 50% over the past 40 years, and those numbers are likely similar here in the United States. In a world that's losing the love, where love is growing cold, where suffering is in, on a, in an all-time high and help is on an all-time low, God is calling us, his church, to rise up and be the hands and feet of Jesus to a hurting world. We are commissioned to not walk away from opportunities God places in our path. Poverty was rampant in Jesus' day, especially where he lived. Palestine was under the Roman occupation where there were oppressive taxes, high levels of debt, and limited resources and opportunities. If you could walk those streets there in Palestine, you would see just how deplorable life was. God sent his son at the right time. The people were trapped in darkness. Poverty was at an all-time high, and feelings of hopelessness prevailed in the human heart. Jesus entered human suffering for the purpose of relieving human suffering. Those who were trapped in the darkness of despair were given the light of hope. It was prophesied of Jesus in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2. The people walked in darkness, have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them light has shined. You know, Jesus was always seen ministering to the poor, sick, and outcasts. His stories and parables illustrate the importance of generosity, compassion, and caring for the least of these, caring for the most vulnerable in society. His work was clear from the beginning. An angel, remember the angel went to Joseph and said that you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. It was just another day of ministry when a lawyer engages Jesus in conversation. His first question was what he must do to inherit eternal life. And so Jesus, of course, replies with what the lawyer was familiar with. He asks him, what is written in the law? And of the lawyer answers in Luke chapter 10, verses 27 to 29. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, you have answered rightly. Do this, and you will live. But the lawyer wasn't fully satisfied with the answer, and so he asks an additional question that Jesus was actually already anticipating from him. He asks in verse 29, Who is my neighbor? One reason we can thank the lawyer is because his question was the catalyst to the Good Samaritan story. This story has been a moral compass for billions of people from generation to generation. In the story, 
there's a traveling merchant. This is actually a picture of the road to Jericho. This road uh, was a route. It was 3,500 feet descent over 17 miles. The road was treacherous and rocky and barren and notorious for muggings and robberies. This wasn't a journey anyone looked forward to, but it was the most lucrative way to sell and trade as a merchant. Commodities were sold at much higher rates in Jericho. And so you had to go to Jericho to make enough money to support your family. Somewhere along his journey, he gets mugged by robbers and is left for dead on the side of the road. He's busted up and now disabled. The most he could do was groan from the excruciating pain he was in. His only hope of survival was if someone would rescue him. Not long after the incident, a priest sees him on the road, but instead of offering help, you remember, he passes by on the other side. A Levite sees him, but also passes on the other side. Finally, a Samaritan sees the merchant and has compassion on him. And in Luke chapter 10, verses 34 and 35, The Bible says, and he went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set on him his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. Verse 35, and on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host and said unto him, take care of him and whatsoever you spend more when I come again, I will will repay you. Wow. What a difference. It was night and day. You see, there's a man. He's beaten and robbed. Most likely, he has a family. Most likely, he has children back at home. And how sad it would be for his children and his family to get the word that his that their father, that her husband is not returning because he's dead. He died on the road. What a horrible uh, day that will be and what, what tragic news that would be for the family. The priest and Levite, they come by. They could save the day, but they choose to pass by on the other side. They say, no. I can't, I can't deal with that. Not today. I can't go over there. So I got to walk on the other side. But then the Samaritan comes and he, and he sees this poor person beaten up, dying on the road, and he has compassion on him. He puts him on his animal. He gets a room in the inn. He stays with him throughout the whole night to make sure everything's going to be okay. And before he leaves, he covers all the expenses and promises to pay more if needed. And then you see the innkeeper's care because the Samaritan told the innkeeper, you know, now you care for him. Now you take care of him. I'll take care of the money. I'll take care of the resources. I'll take care of all the expenses. But, but you, you, please, innkeeper and, and your staff, you, you watch over him until he's fully recovered. This story teaches us that loving our neighbors requires action, not just words. Who is our neighbor? Anyone in need. If we can help them, we should because true love is sacrificial. People who are in crisis are in need of our assistance regardless of their social class, ethnicity, or religious beliefs. If you didn't know, at the time, Samaritans were considered outsiders and were looked down upon by the Jewish people. This is why 
The Samaritan is the unexpected hero in the story. Why? Because Jesus came to break down the caste mentality. He came to build bridges between human hearts and to teach us that we are all one nation under God. Yes, we can respect our individuality, but we must never think ourselves superior to any other member of society. We are all equal at the foot of the cross. Amen? If Jesus were to summarize the lesson he might give us four main points. Number one, pay attention to those in need. Look around for it. See if there's someone you can help. Number two, show compassion and kindness when you see those people. Be the hands and feet of Jesus. Number three, he might say, I want you to remember when you help someone, don't expect anything in return, not even from heaven. And number four, he might say, please break down your prejudices. And that's something only God can do for you and for me. The good Samaritan saw the sufferer and had compassion on him. He didn't avoid him, but made sure he had the best care possible for his recovery. It wasn't convenient for him. His schedule was interrupted. Helping someone heal is a long process and requires much of our time and resources. But even though the Samaritan was busy... He willingly went out of his way to provide for the man's needs, and then he became an eternal example of God's unfailing love. In a world that can be harsh and uncaring, the message of the Good Samaritan is a reminder that we too can make a difference in the lives of others by not walking away by not passing on the other side when we have an opportunity to help someone in need. Good Christians are hard to find. Why? Because nobody is good, Jesus says. There's only one good, and that is God. It is God who enables us to do good things, but none of us can pat ourselves on the back and say that we're good. Even Jesus himself, when the man came to him and said, good master, and Jesus says, why do you call me good? There's only one good, and that is God. But in this world that can be harsh, the message of the good Samaritan is a reminder that we too can make that difference. We don't want to pass by on the other side. We are called to be the hands and feet of Jesus to a hurting world. God's people are to be lights repelling the darkness. The Bible says the world will know that we are Christians not by what we teach, but by how our love is put into action. The Good Samaritan story also teaches us something about salvation. There are many glorious layers of truth in this story. For example, the road from Jericho to Jericho from Jerusalem represents the journey of life, which is full of dangers, hardships, and unexpected turns. The man who was beaten and left for dead represents humanity. Jesus left him anonymous so that any of us here could fit him in. There's not a lot said about this man. Why? So that you can apply yourself into that person's situation. And just as the man was helpless and in need of a Savior, we are also in need of a Savior. Without God's gift of grace, there would be no hope for sinners. The priest and Levite can be seen as types of the law. They represent the legalistic approach to religion that values following rules and regulations over showing compassion and love to those who are hurting and who are needy. Do we have those in our churches still today? 
And of course, the Good Samaritan can be seen as a type of Christ. He saw the wounded man, had compassion on him, and took action to help him. In the same way, Jesus saw our brokenness and had compassion on us, us coming to earth to heal and save us. When we were dead in trespasses in sins, Christ came to our rescue. The application of oil and wine also have significance. The oil and wine are representations of the Holy Spirit and the blood of Christ. Just as the oil and wine brought healing and restoration to the man's physical wounds, the Holy Spirit and the blood of Christ bring spiritual healing and restoration to our brokenness and sin. You know, at the end of the story, the Samaritan places the dying man on his animal. Listen. And carries him to the inn and spends the long, dark night with him. This was the most critical time for this man who was beaten. And the Samaritan is right by him all night. This is exactly what Jesus does for us, isn't it? He's always with us in our darkest hours. He's at our bedsides when we're suffering illness. He holds our hands in the valley of our pain and mental anguish. There's not a passing moment when Jesus is far away. He was in the fire with the three Hebrews. He was in the den with the prophet Daniel. He was in the boat with the disciples on the raging sea. He was with Moses when he told Pharaoh to set his people free. Jesus is with us in our most trying times. And our God never changes. Amen? There's not a passing time when Jesus is far from us. Scripture says on the next day, before the Samaritan departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, take care of him. And whatever more you spend when I come again, I will repay you. The innkeeper and his staff and that inn remind us of the mission of the church. The innkeeper took the wounded man in and cared for him just as the church is supposed to care for and nurture new believers in Jesus. And when our divine Samaritan returns, he will repay us for all we've done to care for the least of these. Whatever resources we use or whatever money we spend to help the needy, it will all be added treasures to the storehouse of heaven. Amen? And I love the details that Jesus places in this story. The Samaritan paid for all the wounded man's expenses, didn't he? Not one mite was given in return, which tells us what? Salvation is a gift. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but it is by God's mercy that he saved us. There's nothing we can do to redeem ourselves. If it weren't for God's grace, we would all be left on the side of the road to die. But praise God, Jesus paid it all. All to him we owe. Sin has left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. For we were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, but we were redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus. 